Let us say amen. We serve a great God. And he truly loves us. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Father in heaven. You are a great one, Father. And we love you, Father. There's no father like you, Father. And Father, your love will stand the test of time, Father. And Father, we just thank you for your amazing grace, Father. And Father, we just truly thank you, Father, over and over and over again, Father. And Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. And we just thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ, Father. And thought, Father, we just thank you because you promised us, us eternal life, Father. And we just thank you for forgiving us of our sins, Father, and our transgressions. And Father, your love will stand the test of time, Father, as it promised us in the scriptures. And we owe it all to you. It's in your holy name we pray. And amen. Many times I have used a video clip to lead into the Lord's Supper. But so much of what we've already done this morning, the prayers have been offered, both prayers to, to ask for supplication of our God to intervene in the lives of people, Amen. but also the celebrations that we enjoy because God is answering prayer. And then these hymns that uh, we've been singing this day, you know, yes, Lord, I need you. There are many times uh, through all these years you, you come to the Lord's Supper and I not only remember Jesus, but I remember how much I need him. Amen. That's right. And one of the greatest, to me, one of the greatest moments of any worship is when we take this Lord's Supper. For we not only testify, we are remembering you, Jesus. But we're also saying, I don't want to go without you, O Lord. That's right. Amen. For you're my Lord and you're my God. That's right. Yes. Oh God, to you we say thank you. In remembrance of Jesus, we, <clears throat> we now eat and drink in his name. Amen. When you get into words like love, it's uh, words that we uh, throw around a lot. We talk about things that we love, the food we love, the cars we love, the places we love to go, the people that we love. Just kind of a vague word to us sometimes. But love has such a meaning to it, a deep meaning that talks about or relates to how we act what we say, what we do. And one of the things that we don't consider is that we say we love, but then our actions, our words don't always speak of it. So I want to take you down the journey for a few moments on some things that are said in Scripture. It's not really identified with the concept of love, but when you understand that God is love mm -hmm. and that we are created in the image of God, God has designed us to be loving people. Right. Uh, sin gets involved in our lives and messes us up and we go down the wrong path. Uh, sin works in our lives in such a way that uh, sometimes we do things that we wish we hadn't done. Sometimes we say things that we wish we had not said. And once they're said, once they're done, no matter how we may talk about forgiveness, it still haunts us. It's still there. It's still very much a part of us. So let me take you down a path a little bit. I'm going to take you first to the Old Testament. Zechariah, while speaking to the people of Israel, the people that by the time Zechariah is, is speaking is a prophet of God, the nation has gone down a road, has taken them out of the loving God that delivered them from slavery to freedom that took them from being a people seen as 
a nomad people to a people building a nation, took them to heights that they never dreamed about before. But now they've reached a point that their, their love for God and their love for each other was getting less and less. And so, chapter 8, verse 16, these words are spoken. These are the things that you should do. Now what's happening here is that Zechariah, being the prophet of God, and a prophet is someone who, who delivers the message. He's delivering the message from God. And he quotes God, here's what he's doing in this chapter 8. And as you have time this week, if you want to go and take a look at that chapter 8, uh, there's a lot going on there. But in these particular verses that I want to look at, which is uh, verses 14 through 17, but 16 is the essence of it. God says to speak the truth to one another, to render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Israel's reached a point where truth doesn't mean much to them. Sometimes as we talk about truth, we, we don't really realize how important truth is. Things exaggerate. Things get said that shouldn't be said that end up not being truthful. Israel's reached a point in their state where God has to remind them, look, you speak the truth to one another. Why? Because I created you to love one another. Right. You don't lie to the people you love. You speak the truth to the people you love. You speak that which encourages and reaches out to them. In judgments, a lot of times we think of judgment in terms of legalistic matters. But God said through his son Jesus, there are two fundamental basic commands. You love God and you love others. Right. Everything should flow out of that. Whether it's judgment, justice if you please, or anything else. It is to flow out of love. So you render in your gates judgments that are true. Israel has reached the point now and, and most of the, the uh, world of that time in which Zechariah is writing, They've reached that point where it's about power, it's about greed, it's about wealth, it's about taking advantage of others. And he says, look, in your gates, in the very cities that you're building, judgments ought to be true. And if judgments are true, then they're intended to make for peace. Now this is where we don't spend much time thinking about. So often judgments are made based upon, well, and we have some type of rule or we have some type of tradition that we follow. But if it doesn't make for peace, it doesn't necessarily come from God. That's right. You see, God intended that judgments be true and they make for peace. Now, what are we setting up here for? Well, I want you to see something that goes back several centuries ago. God had taken this group of people, the descendants of Abraham. God had made Abraham a promise, said, from your descendants, I'm going to make a great nation. God does that. A few hundred years after Abraham, you have, the, for instance, the King David, great king who who was a man who followed God's own heart. But within 300 years after David, Israel had been walking a path away from what was good and right. And prophets like Zechariah come along and say, you got to get your house in order. God didn't make you into a great nation because you're great people. God made you in a great nation because he loved Abraham and is fulfilling his promise. Right. Now, something happens as you go through time here till you get to the first century church. 
On Wednesdays, I've been dealing on the subject of Ephesians. It's a letter that was written to the church in Ephesus by one of the apostles, the Apostle Paul. And there, there's something that comes up here, and it's in verses 14 to 16, where Paul says, you lovingly speak the truth. Again, this concept of love comes into play. Truth, speaking the truth in love, if you please. Caring enough about someone that when you speak truth, you're not shouting at them. You're not belittling them. You're not trying to win a point. You're not trying to, to create something that you want done. You speak the truth in love, a fashion that touches the other individual, and they understand you care. That's hard for us, isn't it? Because we live in a society that says we have the, the freedom to say anything we want. As a Christian, no, we don't, because we are held to and made a commitment to something much higher, That's and right. that is to love others as we love ourselves. Amen. It's about how do you like to be treated? How do you like to be addressed? How do you like the words to be spoken to you? When you think about what's going on here, both with the Apostle Paul and the prophet Zechariah, you're dealing with God is saying to them, speak the truth in love, working in such a way that it brings about peace, and also avoiding the things that God hates. So you begin to discover something. In this love, it isn't about saying, I love you. It's about acting in a way that says, I love you. Amen. It's not just words. It's the very actions, what you do for someone, how you touch someone, what you say to someone, how you treat someone. And in this story, or in this letter to the church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul is challenging the followers of Christ in Ephesus to act in a way that demonstrates the body of Christ. You see, Ephesus is a community in the midst of a society and a culture that does not recognize God. It's in a time in which the goddesses like Diana have become the ones that everyone is praising and, and singing to and giving to. But this group of believers in Ephesus are being challenged in such a way to be a body of believers that are demonstrating to that community who God is. And he goes on in these verses that we're talking to this chapter 4 to say, in the midst of this love that you are to have, you are to practice humility, you are to practice gentleness, you are to practice patience, and you do all this by speaking the truth in love. You see, I broke into the passage and just gave you a phrase. Now, what's the context? The context is, look, you belong to God. You're following Jesus, this one that God sent to this world to save us from all sin. The one that paid for all price, paid the ultimate price for all sin, past, present, and future. You have been given an opportunity that is rare. Now, speak the truth in love because it is about living life in a way that makes a difference. And even when you're surrounded by a culture that does not recognize such greatness as we're talking about here, we are to do it. We do not become like them, like the culture we're in. We become the light, we become the salt, Amen. we become the very example of what God is all about. I have so loved you that I've sent Jesus. Right. I make every sacrifice to touch your life you, and to make a difference. And even if it means walking through the valley of the shadow of death, then let it be so. That's right. But let it be lived in a way that speaks the truth in love. 
Now, practical. How do we speak the truth in love? Jesus, again, dealt with this. I, I'm amazed that so often uh, people talk about Scripture, but they don't identify the point of what Jesus is all about and what he does and what he teaches in Scripture. What Jesus does in his ministry, he sets this oh, framework to operate within. And everything that follows, for instance, to the church in Ephesus, or the church in Philippi, or the church in Corinth, or the church in Rome, or the seven churches of Asia. In other words, all these places that are talked about in the New Testament. When Paul speaks, what Paul is doing is saying, long ago our Lord taught us something. Here's the best way to carry it out. It's the Holy Spirit saying to us, now you've got to put something into place that carries out what Jesus was talking about. Right. But at the same time, understand that long before Jesus, God identified what it's all about. He took Israel, for instance, and said, speak the truth in love. Continues by saying, speak the truth in love by the Christians, by the disciples that will follow Jesus. But sometimes it's hard to speak the truth in love. There are issues to be dealt with that can be very difficult. So let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Jesus, there, there are many passages I could go to. This one I, I want to identify with you because it is used so often. But I want you to listen to what's going on in Matthew 18. Jesus, uh, in the midst of, of a number of things that he's teaching his disciples, as a matter of fact, at the end of this, he says, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be with you. So you, you have to consider, in the context that he puts this, he's also talking about our relationships with each other. Not just about the worship experience, but about the very events of being together. What happens? Well, there's always difficulties. And so as you, as you read through the passages, um, he starts in verse 14. And so let me pick up just the verse here before verse, I've got 15 and 17. And I didn't write the verses up there so much as I wanted you to have phraseology. Uh, verse 14, he says, stop acting like children. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, Jesus is addressing his audience. He says, I expect some things of you. Children are in a growing state. They learn, they do, they, they, they have to, to learn. Uh, you, you think about children, the first time you take them any place. Um, I was doing a funeral recently, and uh, this first time the family had had to experience death. And so they had a, a number of little kids sitting here. Kids had no idea what to do. And so, the, the parents were trying to figure out how do we handle our children. So I, I stopped what I was doing in the funeral home and said, hey, guys, the next generation is sitting here. And there's things that they're going to have to hear because this grandparent has set such a wonderful example for them. And so don't get impatient with your grandchildren. They've never been here before. They've never experienced anything like this. So when we leave here today and the time comes right, tell them of the stories about this grandparent who touched their lives, loved them, cared for them, and made the sacrifices for them. Amen. And that is so important to do. And so what Jesus is addressing an audience here, an audience that did not know, had not heard Jesus before. This is, you know, early on in Jesus' ministry. Well, not too early. It's probably sometime after the first couple years of the ministry. They've never heard anyone identify what Jesus is doing. When Jesus spoke, he spoke as no one else had ever spoken and no one will ever speak like. He was God in the flesh, putting things in ways that we could understand it. And so he, he comes to this audience and he says, you've got to understand Children need to learn and they need to grow. They need to be taught. They need to hear the stories and they need to be, 
the, the principles need to be identified for them to live by. They need to be lifted up. They, they need to see what it is to live a great life. So he, he starts out and he says, you guys have been acting like kids, so stop it. <laughs> Quit acting like a kid. You know, that gets your attention, doesn't it? If someone walks up to you and says, hey, quit acting like a child. All of a sudden, as an adult, man, oh, wait a minute, what have I been doing? It hits you. Or you go to the other extreme and say, how dare you get out of my face, you know. So you go one of the two ways, usually. So he says to them, verse 14, look, stop acting like children. Uh, if a believer does something wrong, go confront this one. Okay. Now immediately what we do with this passage is when Jesus says, you know, you confront, when you confront someone, you go confront them about something they've done wrong. But he, he says to believers, he says, believers? So is he only talking about believers or is there a principle here? There's a principle in this passage. He's addressing an audience that he knows, an audience that's been following him. He says, if you believe in me, then listen to what I'm saying to you. Right. But he's also laying out a principle that every person in any culture, society can learn from. So he says, confront a person who's done something wrong. Confront that person, but do so when you're alone. What's the hardest thing in the world? Hardest words, some of the hardest words you say is I'm sorry. You realize you make a mistake. Sometimes you, you've done and you've worked in a hard way and all of a sudden you realize I blew it. And it's embarrassing, isn't it? You don't, you don't want to say, hey, I blew it. And when someone confronts you in public, what's the hardest thing about it is the embarrassment that you're feeling. Love does not seek to, to embarrass. That's right. Love seeks to improve. That's right. That's Love right. seeks to lift up. Yep. Now, where'd you get that? 1 Corinthians 13. Amen. What is love? And, and Paul defines it there very clearly. And that's what's being defined here. So choose to be alone. Spend some time with them. Well, what if then after you talked about it, they're mad or they're upset or they say, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. What do you do? And he says to them, look, take a couple of people with you. Now, here's the mistake that's made in the passage. Let me go back to it here. But if, you will, if the person will not listen, take one or two others with you so that every accusation may be verified by two or three witnesses. Generally, we think in terms, okay, I'll take someone with me and we're going to gang up on this person. The witnesses are there to verify what's going on, not to be participants. Right. You understand the difference? Mm -hmm. See, most of the time we look at this passage, we say, all right, let me find two or three people to agree with me and we're going to go gang up on this person and beat them up really well. <laughs> That's generally the attitude. You see it all the time. But what Jesus is describing is he's picked up a thought that that culture long understood. It isn't about ganging up on someone. It's about you spending time with that person and then having the witnesses to verify that you did just that. Right. Why? Because the next step is, if they still don't listen, you take it to the community. Uh, there, there's a word here we translate church, depending on which translation that you use here. But he's talking about the community of believers, that group of people that are together. You take it to the group that you're a part of. See, it doesn't do any good to take it someplace where no one's going to be supported and helped. And now, if they choose to ignore the community and what's been going on, then you treat them as a heathen or as a tax collector. Now, again, you're using terms that fit that culture and that moment. What is he saying? Where the hidden would be that person that did not follow God. Right. Now, 
How do you treat them? Now see, generally we look at it in a negative way, don't we? It's interesting when you get to the writings of Peter, Peter says to the, to the uh, for instance, the wife that's a believer, this is in uh, 1 Peter, and uh, chapter 3, and he, he says, look, you marry someone that's a non-believer, then by your example, touch their life. You see, treat as a heathen doesn't imply necessarily something bad. It says, what are you going to do to make a difference to them? You are to be the salt and the light of the world. Here's the term, tax collector. I don't know about you, but I've been audited several times through the, the 50 plus years that, that I've been doing taxes. And well, more like 60 years. <laughs> Have to stop remembering my age, Joe. <laughs> and uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty good experience but I'm respectful when I go in. You know, he's not talking about destruction here. But so often we put things into that because of our own emotions. And all Jesus is saying to him, he says, look, if you need to deal with someone, here's a way to deal with them. So here's the points I want you to see. Bottom line, I didn't realize how much time I'd take it. Bottom line, what am I saying to you? All things are to be done in love. Amen. Well, I don't like somebody. Okay, that's fine. But you're a Christian. That's right. And it says you are to love. Yeah. Wow, puff. I love you, but I ain't going to like you. <laughs> that's generally what we say there, don't we? Then? But that loving means I'm going to act different towards you than the way culture acts. Truth and justice are, God, are godly essentials for peace. That's right. We talk a lot about peace, but generally what we talk about when we say peace is, you do it my way and we'll be at peace. That's not what we're being taught in scripture. Truth and justice are something that are very essential to be a godly person because God is offering peace to us, a peace that passes understanding, right. if I can quote that passage to you. A peace that's far more difficult than what we think in terms of. So what am I going to do? Well, you're going to confront what is wrong. And you may have to confront with witnesses. And the witnesses are just someone that's going to, to see what's going on and observe. And third, if the wrong is there and no change is taken, then we need to take it to the proper public venue to deal with it. And that's all that's being said in that passage. Don't put more into that passage than sometimes people want to. Pay attention to what Jesus does. The bottom line comes from what we've been singing. We're here to love. That's right. Hatred and anger and violence and ugliness in the words that we give to each other does not speak of love. That's right. Right. And again, that's difficult for us because yep. we are emotionally tied in. And our emotions sometimes take us down the wrong path. So pay attention to what Jesus is teaching us. And I'll leave that message with us.